Okay. Once again, a very good evening to everyone in the room. Thank you very much for joining us for this very important conversation today. My name is Mwanyengwanda Pewoshale Shapwanale. I'm the Communications and Stakeholder Director for Reconnaissance Energy Namibia, uh, the Namibian subsidiary of Recon Africa. We are doing oil and gas exploration in the Kavango, Eastern Kavango West regions of the country. I will be your moderator for the day, moderating the conversation. Uh, again, this very important conversation. Um, before we get into it, um, I'd like to just observe protocol. The invited guests, captains of industries, captains of industries, professionals, students, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I would like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Sindila of RBS, an expert in his trade, Miguel Archo, Namibia and Angola Country Manager for Energy Power Edison, uh, sorry, Energy Power, Edison Guase, the Deputy Director of Accrual Audit, the core team in the Extractive Industry Audit Committee. And then I'd also like to acknowledge the EU being represented uh, here in the room. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Mr. Hev Rousseau, I have that correct? Let's see. Okay. The conversation for today is the standing. It's okay. The conversation today is the journey of oil and gas. Oil and gas has not been is not new to Namibia. It's not something that started yesterday. It's not something that started two years ago. It's something that started a number of years ago. But as we will learn today, the journey is not one that starts today and ends tomorrow. It's one long one. But we are here to understand exactly what are the steps, what happens during these steps, and where in the country are we here now? Where in the, this timeline are we now? Can we say that next year we'll be able to have a pump or a liter or a barrel in our cars? Or does this mean that it's going to take place 20 years from now? I'd like to welcome... Uh, representing the NAS Vice Chancellor's Office, uh, Dr. Stanley, if you can please join us to do the welcoming remarks as we continue this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Director of Proceedings for Public Lecture. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure moment. Uh, this week, I was getting calls, and uh, I think we need to do this quite often. I know we do this quite a lot, but a lot of a lot of our friends, colleagues, families are not aware what is a public public lecture. They were asking me, "Where's the invitation? Where do I go? Uh, can I just come in?" I said, "Yes, this is what is all meant to have a public lecture. It's public, open to anyone." who has interest on the topic. Okay, I just wanted to put that as a side note before I do the welcoming remarks on the behalf of the NAST Vice Chancellor, Dr. Errol Naumab, who unfortunately could not be with us this evening. I would like also to extend your uh, acknowledgement. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge uh, the Vice Chairperson of the Namibia Petroleum Operators Association, uh, Mr. Martin Mekonga, where are you seated? Welcome, sir. Good to have you. I reckon Namibia senior geologist, uh, Dr. An uh, Ansa Wanke. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Then also would like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Edison Gudase. Gudase. He's from the Office of the Auditor General. And then also Mikal Aleko. He's from the, he or he is from the Energy, Capital and Power. Welcome, sir. Then obviously all members of the NAS community, uh, members of the media here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening once again. I'm indeed honored to welcome you all first to the NAS campus, and secondly to this very important public lecture held under the theme, Understanding Oil and Gas from Exploration Stage to Production and where Namibia is, is on the timeline. 
very short and we know we can all relate to this theme. This event forms part of a series of conversations hosted by the Alumni and NAS Foundation aimed at educating and informing the Namibian nation about ongoing oil and gas activities in the country and the significant potential this sector holds for the growth and development of Namibia. I may ask at this point, what mode of, of transport you use to come to this venue? By raise of hands, who used a vehicle, who used a, uh, some vehicle to come to campus? Electrical vehicle, great. Some use hydrogen vehicles, uh, some were footing. Uh, nonetheless, oil and gas, we know this is something quite very important to all of us. Uh, and even on the spike that repo is, uh, I mean, rising as a skyrocket, we still have to live within this environment. At the onset, I wish to commend Mr. Kaitira Kanji, the director of the Alumni and NAS Foundation, and his team to, for organizing for us such as uh, this, where experts and knowledgeable individuals can share information regarding topical issues and of public interest. A university is an institution that generates and disseminates knowledge. We have a responsibility to create platforms that bring together in industry experts, renowned academics and specialists to dissect and discuss topics that rank highly on the national development agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, in July 2022, we launched a public lecture series on petroleum activities in Namibia. The first public lecture in this series was held under the theme, Oil and Gas Exploration from a Namibian Perspective. The event was officiated by the Minister of Mines and Energy, Honorable Tom, Tom Alwendo. And then the second public lecture took place in September 2022 under the theme, economic benefits derived from the oil and gas discovery and focus on the potential benefits of oil discoveries to communities, industry and the country at large. In November, the same year, 2022, we hosted a third public lecture in this series. At this occasion, the focus we cast skills and the human capital needed for the oil and gas industry. This evening, we resume the public lecture series, and I'm proud to announce that this year, we will host a total of five public lectures broadly focused on oil and gas in this year, 2023. That a number of events geared towards integrating different topics under the oil and gas banner have and will be hosted as indicative of a number of things. Firstly, the oil and gas industry is significant ranking among the most top 10 industries in the world. It has a market value of 4.6 trillion US dollars, making up to 3.8% of the total GDP. I think we should take note of that. Over the past decade, global demand for crude oil and natural gas has experienced annual growth, except in 2022, uh, sorry, in 2020. And in 2022, global demand for oil stood at just over 92 million barrels per day and is expected to rise to 104 million barrels per day in 2026. Secondly, a closer look to home here in Namibia. We have, there have been developments in the Namibian oil industry as we have over the past 18 months receive regular announcements of oil discoveries and, adv and, 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 ad and advancements in the different stages of the oil production cycle. As a result, public interest on this topic has, has uh, peaked and there is an increasing need for information conversation and education. Regarding this important sector, the significant potential it holds for the development of our country, placing under the spotlight a number of topics in, in the context of oil and gas industry is also important when it, we consider the divergent outcomes witnessed across the world where oil and gas have been discovered as such resources has been exploited. While some have successfully leveraged the benefits from this industry, 
to achieve significant developmental progress, others have become hamstrung by government challenges, largely failed to transfer such benefits to the wider societies. It is therefore important that, we, that while our imagination is captured by the rapid development of oil, rich nations, we are aware of an, of an understand that the pitfalls and dangers that accompany, accompany this sector. It is, it is here that informed debate and discussions will serve as the guiding light to eliminate our path. And we as, a leading, as Namibia's leading university of science and technology are honored to provide a platform, a platform for, for these discussions. In conclusion, when I'm uh, in concluding these uh, re welcoming remarks, I wish you should really listen attentively to contribute to the speakers this evening, ask questions to them, enrich your understanding. The Namibian oil and gas industry is under development and will soon be a major player in our co country's economy. It is therefore at, uh, it is therefore up to each each and one of us to ensure that we have equipped ourselves with the knowledge to, to, to understand where the benefits of our society will lie and how we use how we use and leverage for the betterment of all our Namibians. For those of you who are opening remarks, I welcome you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor, indeed. I think we all feel welcomed, and I think we all are ready to get into the conversation of oil and gas, uh, where, Namibia is, uh, where Namibia is at and understanding exactly this journey. Now, without, I know that there were those in the beginning who are still in, in reminding me that it's 5.30, and we are, five, uh, we are 30 minutes delayed, so I will not waste any further time and like to call on uh, Mr. Martin Neronga is the Vice Chairperson of the Petroleum Operators Association of Namibia, who will be giving us a brief presentation on the journey of upstream oil and gas in Namibia and preparing us uh, for the conversation that we will be having afterwards. Chapwendale, um, thank you for the introductions. And I just want to apologize for coming a bit late. Um, yeah, as you know already, um, I work at Damco if my introduction was not already you know, given by Chapwendale. And a lot of things have been in the media lately about Namco. So coming late is, yeah, it's becoming sort of a, a problem for us. Um, nonetheless, I, I think let's get right into it since I'm already late and I don't want to keep everybody um, uh, in this theater. I think the theme has already been set on, on what these discussions are going to be about today. And, and I think we just want to share um, some of the activities that have been happening and also to give you a context on, on the journey. Because if you don't know where the journey began, you really wouldn't understand where everything else is heading. Um, so that's what the themes are for today. It was, it's going to be all about. Next slide. Can you skip a slide? No, I think you skip one slide. Yeah. So yeah. So basically, as an empowered vice, vice chairperson, uh, we're an, an organization, a non-profit organization, basically, uh, which composed of about fifteen members, um, uh, of which a majority are international oil and gas companies. Uh, these are your Total, Shell, Exxon, and then everybody else. So basically. The association being unprofitable for us is just to, to, to try and engage um, our stakeholders and also to form as a linkage uh, between both government and then the operators. Okay, so we try to serve most of the time the interests of our members. So we are about fifteen, and the organization is fairly new, maybe about eight years old. So it's not really that old. Okay. Next slide. So basically, in Namibia, what happens is that especially with exploration. You know, we have mining uh, and then oil and gas, and then obviously now it's green hydrogen. But with oil and gas, it, it's not something that is new. It's something that started quite a long time ago. Um, like offshore, for instance, it started in the 1960s. 
I think most of you, all of you are aware of the Kuru gas discovery. This was done in 1974, for instance. But back then, the license system, you know, the, you know, the license system that was put in place was different. Okay? What we have in Namibia currently is an open license system. Basically, that means that an area that is open, whether it's onshore or offshore, you are more than welcome at any time to approach government and then you can apply as an individual or as a company. So there are no restrictions to that. But there are three, there are basically three licenses that we normally operate under. Being first, you know, the first one is reconnaissance. So basically this one is more like your research. And then you have your petroleum exploration license. This is the one that most of the companies are operating under because this one is the one that um, gives, gives, gives a lot of company the license to operate. And then the third one is the production license. There's only one company that has that license, which is, a, which is currently BW. But that license changed hands since 1974, uh, since the field was discovered by Chevron. So you can see already that nothing really stays static in this industry. Things tend to progress very quickly. The license tenure themselves are different. With reconnaissance, it's a bit less, which is about two years, and then you can renew it if you want. With the production exploration license, it's about four years, with several extensions and renewals through that period. So the license period can be anything from 10 to 12 years. That is just exploration. And you haven't even done, and you haven't even found anything yet, we're just exploring. So that is the length of time that we are looking at. Now for production license, this one is only given in the circumstances when you are ready to produce a field. When you have found something that is worth producing. That is the only time that you can be given that license, and it's for 25 years, okay? Now, when it comes to the taxation system or fiscal system, this has become a point of contention. And yeah, I know some questions are going to come on the 10% and so forth. But I think, I think the taxation system is set up quite well. Um, because when you, look at, when you look at this industry, once it's production, a lot of revenue is going to come, a lot of it. So for government, we only have three instruments for that at the moment, which is royalties 5%. This is on gross income. The moment that crude comes out of that well, we sell it, government is already getting 5%. And then you go 35%. That is your petroleum income tax. And then you have your 25%. That is your additional profit tax. This is now in case when companies start making a lot of profit, when the oil price is very high, because we know that happens, OK? So that is another instrument that is, that is in there. And there's an additional, again, that in the case they are making super profits, there's an, an additional uh, APT that triggers in. So it's, 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 it's a ripple effect of, you know, of the profits that the companies are making to ensure that government gets at least revenue from that. And the additional payment is basically what we have in the agreements is that Federal Fund gets a contribution, the company also pay the license fees. Now, if you put all those especially the taxes together, that comes to about, what, maybe 55% or 65%, and then you add NAMCOS 10% on top of it, which comes to about maybe 65 or 75%, depends on how the contracts were negotiated. So you can already see that a vast majority of the revenue is gonna go to government, okay? Next slide. Now, when it comes to the history of licensing or or the operators, you can see the maps change over time because companies come and then they go. Uh, so the number never stays really the same. Um, so from 2004, we, we, we really didn't want to go back to 1974 because the map will, will probably have one company that is there. So since 2004, you can already see that it was the only two companies that had license to operate, petroleum you know, exploration licenses. Those were the two companies and one production license, which obviously is historical, which is a Kuru gas field license. And then 2007, you can, you can already see the activities are picking up, okay? Now we're in 2023. That map, as it looks at the moment, is gonna change because there are other companies that have already made applications. So, so there's definitely an increase in activities, especially after the discoveries, okay? Next slide. In terms of the drilling, because that's where things happen, Again, exploration when you're doing work and drilling, it, it happens about the same time. But you need to drill first to be sure. What you, what you want to drill 
it's really something that is worth risking because this is money that you're going to be wasting. Eventually, somebody has to, to spend that money. But, but in Namibia, government has never spent a single cent. But I, that is one thing that I think we need to be clear about. Most of the risk, especially for drilling, has been taken by the companies. Okay? So since 1994, this is after independence, we have drilled about 12 wells from that period. All of them were dry. So basically, it means we found nothing. Okay? Now, the money that was spent to drill that, these are hundreds of millions of, of US dollars because that's the currency where we are operating. And then from 2014 to 2018, again, dry. Now you can see for us geological, you know, ge you know geoscientists, um, a dry well is information. But for an investor, it's not something that they want because they want money. You know, they want a return on their, you know, on their investment. Okay, in 2018 to 2023, there, yeah, things started happening. And then we discovered in 2021, tw yeah, 2022, that's when the discoveries came in. Uh, and then that changed the whole ball game for Namibia. Because now that's where things are starting to happen. Uh, on offshore, um, Dr. Anske, that's where they are operating on. Um, there haven't really been a lot of activities on shore, but with Recon doing their work, um, 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 it, 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 it has also sort of, you know, enhanced, you know, the interest of companies. Okay. Next slide. Now, I don't want to go too much into, into details, you know, okay, with this slide, because most of those wells are the ones that have been drilled. And in total, we had about 16 dry wells with a level of investment of about $2 billion. US dollars. That is just on the drilling. We do not even include the acquisition of data in terms of seismic, aeromagnetic, and so forth, or technical work that was done. It's exclusive of that. That is just drilling one single well. This company spent almost close to, the number is there, about $30 billion Namibian dollars. So that is the level of risk that these companies have paid to drill these wells. But for us, it's information that led us to where we are today, OK? Now, when you look at from 2021, when Shell and Total um, uh, made these uh, three or three to four discoveries, the amount they spent in, in less than two years, 340 million US dollars. That's about 6.1 million Namibian dollars just on those wells. So these are just estimates. Because due to confidentiality reasons, we cannot give you the exact numbers. OK? So, so, so those are the level of investments these companies are operating you know, in terms of risking capital. Now, the, the life cycle, the way it happens is that we're going to go into discussion with it. You start right at the beginning, because you need to follow that sequence. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Uh, you can't jump. It's almost like learning how to walk. You, know, you can't jump any, any of that step. So you do your data acquisition first. That's going to take you about four years or maybe 10 years, depending, depending on what information you have and what you don't have. And then you go into now your drilling. If you are, com you know, if you are confident enough, it can take about you know, four or five years. But the level of investment keeps going up. The whole reason is that your geological chances of success is very much dependent on information that you get. Because you don't want, it's almost like we know when you set up your business, you need to be sure about those numbers. Otherwise, you're going to be losing money. So here, we are trying to de-risk. Every little information we get, we de-risk. But at the same time, the expenditure goes up. OK? So where we are right now, even though we're going to go into discussion, it's where that green line is. Everything else to the left, we have done. Now we are just left with everything else to the right. But again, your level of investment goes up. OK? Next slide. Where we are now in terms of operations, um, most of the focus is on the, it's basically on the Orange Basin, which is in the south of Namibia. And this is the equity split, as we call it, in terms of the operator, the partners, as we call them, or JV partners, of which Namco is one of them. As you can see from that map, Namco on average, we are about 10, 10%, but the number of licenses that we are in are actually more. So to us, this, so basically, when we look at this, is to say that in the event, if you, if you model some, you know, if you do a modeling, and all of those blocks where we have interest is a discovery, 
then it could mean that we have about 50%. So we can, Nemco is literally de-risked. If you, if you wanna bet on something, you better, you know, rather be close to Nemco because you are, you know, you have, you know, because you have footprint everywhere. So you don't lose out, okay? But, you know, but the, you know, the major operators there, it's those ones that are actually on the, on your right, um, Total, Shell, Rhino, and then the rest. Chevron came in last year. They've been very aggressive. Pen Continental, they were quiet. Suddenly, we are seeing Woodside want to come in. So you can already see the interest is really picking up. Okay, next slide. So in terms of the activities, what is currently happening is that, especially with Total and Shell, we all know Shell drilled, they discovered Yonka, then they went back again, they are praising. Now, they are praising in the same way where they made a discovery last year. But at the same time, also, they're also planning to drill extra, you know, extra holes, as we call them. So these are wells. So there are about five wells um, that we're anticipating. And then, as well as with Total, is the same thing. They are already appraising uh, the giant field that they found, the Venus. And then they also plan to drill more wells. And then we have Gulp as well, uh, who have a commitment to drill a well. Okay? With Kudu, they are, yeah, Kudu is very historical. They're in a fifth stage. But at the same time, they're also doing a bit of exploration as well. Okay? So, so basically, this is what is happening in terms of, of data acquisition. Uh, those companies I've mentioned, uh, they've, in one year already, we have already seen companies acquiring data like we have never seen before, and we can't keep up with it. But for us, it's information that we want, as well as also for them to make informed decisions on their exploration, you know, their exploration ventures. So all those four companies have already acquired data, and this data itself, obviously, they are spending. If you know Namco is carried, we are not spending a single cent. Okay. For Kudu, yeah, um, I can't really speak for Kudu, um, but that's where we are. Um, the project hasn't hasn't really changed much, but it has evolved over time, and and, and they have plans definitely to uh, to generate electricity using the gas. Okay, I think that was my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for that. Uh, I want to say in depth, and it may, may seem in depth for us, but the conversation will now really show you what in depth conversation is because this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just understanding what the fiscal regime looks like. This is just understanding uh, what the, from the outside, really, the skeleton looks like. But without further ado, I'd like to invite my panelist. Uh, I know, uh, Martin, you just sat down, but if we can just have you back. Uh, Martin, um, not only is he the vice chairperson of Nempoa, but as he also rightfully said, he also is an executive with Namco. Um, and then we also like to invite Dr. Anska Wanka. He is a chief geologist for Recon Namibia uh, with plus 20 years, almost say 20,000, with 20 plus years um, of Ge uh, geology expertise. Thank you very much. Can we give them a round of applause? That will motivate them to not be too technical and I will really try my utmost best to make sure that they don't, um, don't speak to us like they're speaking to fifth year geology students. And please also do bear with me. I'm also just a, a I'm also learning. So where I ask questions, um, it's because I'm also not a geologist at all. I try to be sometimes, but I'm not. Okay, we'll get right into it. Um, Anska, Dr. Wanka, if I can start with you. We're here to understand the journey of oil and gas uh, from exploration stage to production stage. We now know that we can break down the journey into at least three phases upstream middle stream and downstream. But now even this also needs further breakdown. Can you just give us, a st what does the step of oil and gas start with? The very first step of exploring for oil and gas. Where does that start? Thank you, Van Yengla. Thank you, Van Yengla, uh, for the question. Uh, first, uh, good evening to the audience. 
and I'm happy to see such a packed auditorium um, giving a sign that there is a keen interest to learn about this industry. Yeah, back to your question. Where does the journey start with? Um, let's start from the very beginning. It starts essentially with an interest of a, of a person or usually of a company, interest or intention to explore, find, exploit uh, petroleum and is eventually sell it as a profit. So it is this intention, usually it's energy companies, they look, let's look in the case of Namibia, we are in most areas still, uh, let's say, premature in terms of exploration. I will explain uh, later stage uh, what premature means. So they look at, a, at an area, let's say, where there is um, the possibility to find hydrocarbons and where you can also explore and acquire license. So those companies uh, look what fits in their portfolio, which types of assets they want to acquire. They usually go around the world, so one needs to be competitive what one can offer in terms of licenses and also in terms of geology. And then they decide um, where to put in their money, apply for a license, and uh, hopefully get it granted. That is the very first step. But before that is even a screening what those uh, companies do. And the main screening is, well, number one, is there a petroleum potential in that region? But that is not the main screening. The main screening is, is the country stable? Once we negotiate a petroleum contract, can we trust that this will not just be thrown over or we have state capture? That is number one. If this is not given, a, a company will not even look where the license areas are located. Then look at the fiscal terms. Uh, Martin elaborated on this 5% uh, royalties and, and the other taxes. Can they eventually make profit? That's an important aspect. But it goes also more in the entire uh, socioeconomic context of the country. Is there, what is the demography? Is there a population that can eventually be a skilled workforce to assist this industry? Or what is the current infrastructure and which infrastructure developments are important not to only carry out the exploration, also later the production and offloading to the customer. And last but definitely not least is the environmental considerations. Um, for example, are we operating, let's say, in a shallow sea like, like Saudi Aramco is doing with coral reefs? So does it need extra infrastructure for environmental protection? Or is it an ultra deep water or mountainous environment which would require more technical, more expensive solutions? So this also plays a role. Thank you, very, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wangta. So that already tells us that even before the journey actually starts, there's a journey before that. Now the exploration stage consists of activities such as stratigraphic well uh, test, uh, uh, drilling, you have seismic both aero data as well as on the ground thumping, and then you also have uh, the seismic, the stratigraphic well uh, drilling. Can you just tell us what exactly is this? What, what, do, what is meant by stratigraphic well drilling? What is meant by seismic data acquisition? What are these activities? It's a pleasure to answer these questions because I'm a technical person. Um, so how you do your exploration uh, depends very much at which exploration stage your basin is. So um, to go to this individual methods, uh, I like to, to spend a minute on that. And I always like to use a historical example outside Namibia. Um, one of the main global oil and gas provinces is, is the North Sea. And currently the North Sea, now as we are in 2023, over 20,000 uh, wells are documented there. Uh, currently, 
up to now it's up over 4 or 4.5 to 6 5 billion barrels of oil or oil equivalents have been produced to date um, now i guess uh, the production active production wells are probably below 100 maybe 80 to 90 but how did that journey start it started in what we termed the premature phase. There is little known about the geology and where to find oil, but some indicators we should look for it. So it took about 200 wells to, to understand in the North Sea how to explore, how to understand what you term geological the place. Um, then some oil was found, but it was not commercial. It took then another 30, 34 wells, if I remember, that then in the Norwegian sector, the Ecofisk field, a big discovery was made, and this was made in 1969. And so, sorry, doctor, just to cut you there, does this mean that it took 235 wells drilled before they could really say that they got a well where they, they got the oil out? Just correct. Now, that is a bit scaring. We don't have so many wells here offshore, and nobody would do this investment uh, these days. But these days, also, the technology was not that much advanced, in particularly the seismic imaging. So uh, that we have less than 20 wells in Namibia and already three discoveries is, is a blessing, just to say this. So once you have uh, your first discoveries and you start understanding the geology and your technology, your exploration technique works, you enter the mature phase. So essentially every other well is a discovery. And this goes on for a while until virtually everything in a certain province has been found and understood. And then you go into the post-mature phase, you hardly find anything new, geology, fields are more marginal, smaller, and, and technical, more complex to explore and to exploit. Looking at uh, Namibia, virtually everywhere offshore and onshore, we are still in the premature phase. Only now recently, we are approaching the early mature phase in the Orange Basin uh, with the recent discoveries and understanding what we geologically term uh, the geological play concepts that are successful. Yeah, now come to the individual techniques. Uh, apologize for this extra minute for, for that background. It depends on which stage you are of understanding your area. Oil and gas is usually almost always found in so-called basins. Basins are areas in which thick columns of sedimentary sediments uh, dominate. And we are now looking at rock formations that meet certain criteria. One criteria is, is there a sedimentary rock formation that can generate petroleum under certain conditions? Are there rock formations that can store, contain those generated petroleum in a, in a conventional play? And are there situations prepping, sealing configurations, as we term them, that, that keep and preserve concentrations of petroleum over geological times that's still there today in quantities that can be um, exploited. So we look at the type of rocks. And offshore in the sea where most exploration is happening, you can only reach those rocks uh, via drilling, and onshore, sometimes outcrop studies can help, but we need to look what's in the subsurface, hundreds or better kilometers, three or four kilometers under uh, the surface. So drilling is, is getting this information from those rocks. In order to know where which rocks in which configurations are, there are a number of techniques. Let's say, we don't know the thickness of the rock and where the basin starts and ends. Usually, uh, this starts and with airborne geophysical surveys, uh, men which actually take measurements of variations of the Earth's magnetic and gravity field. And from there, um, 
so-called inversion procedures can be carried out to get at least a gross architecture of a sedimentary basin. Based on this, you may then go further and um, look into a seismic acquisition. Usually it starts along linear or curved line, we term it two-dimensional, which is a kind of echo sounding, like ultra uh, sounding, uh, like in medicine application, just with a different, that these images not go through human tissues, it goes five, six kilometers through rocks and back. So with these images, we have no rocks, but we have a geophysical signal that gives us an architecture of rock layering, faulting, uh, whether it's a dense, we term it a fast rock or a slow rock. So with this information, we start creating, let's say, our geological maps at cross sections from what we not see, what we haven't seen yet, and uh, target our drilling locations. And then usually exploration wells are targeted at locations where a petroleum accumulation is possible. We talk about stratigraphic wells. Stratigraphic wells are a little bit different. They not aim primarily to find a geological natural accumulation of petroleum. They aim to understand what is in the subsurface before we go further. Stratigraphic wells, there had been a number drilled in Namibia, I think one also in 1969, the ST1, so quite some years back. Um, also reconnaissance energy, where I'm currently um, I'm doing uh, much of the geology, there has been drilling stratigraphic wells. Those aim to understand what is in the subsurface, are the rock formations suitable to be part of what we term a petroleum system, and ideally already have indications of the presence of petroleum. Offshore, you would never drill a stratigraphic well. The reason is very simple. Offshore wells are exorbitantly expensive. I think there is nothing to drill these days with higher rip cost uh, below 40 million US dollars. While seismic acquisition, as you just have the sea, no houses, no streets, no forests, is relatively quick and fast to do. Onshore, it's different. It depends much on the terrain. Um, seismic acquisition can be particularly uh, difficult and also expensive, and you may opt to drill a well first. Doctor, um, I want to stay with you before I move over to uh, Martin, because now you've taken us through exploration stage, you've taken us through the activities that take place in the exploration stage. We now know that from the presentation of uh, Martin's presentation and your brief also background day, that we what follows is the appraisal stage. Um, can you tell us what happens, what is the appraisal stage, what happens during this stage, um, what happens during a development stage, and if you can also just take us, elaborate on the feed stage, because we also know that um, that's something that's, uh, that re is relevant to us at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Martin actually had at this presentation and one of the early slides, which showed all the stages, roughly how much of the percentage of the capital investment is needed and when the profit come and also roughly the timeline in years. Everything is variable, but it's a very good guide. So um, with the exploration, you aim to have a discovery. Uh, what is a discovery? I talk as a geologist as a technical discovery. That means one well proves the presence of movable, that means producible, extractable, petroleum that you can bring to the surface. This doesn't mean it's in quantities or technically easy to produce in quantities that are economic. So there is also, let's say, the commercial discovery once you know you can um, produce it as a profit. And that's where the appraisal stage comes in. So once you have pro proven the existence of petroleum accumulations that can be produced, you need to determine the size of the field, uh, the extent, the lateral and, and, and vertical extent, the recoverable volumes. You may only be able to take out 30% of those 
uh, total volumes, or 50%, so you determine the recoverable volumes. And you also do the field economics. At which costs can you take it out, and, and which volumes these are, and under which market scenarios can you make a profit. So this is all part of the appraisal phase, and technically means it's a drilling of appraisal wells. So these are wells that delineate the field, that make flow tests, that may measure reservoir conditions, that take more fluid and uh, uh, rock samples. And with this careful analysis, you get an estimate of the size of the recoverable resources, and you already get quite good uh, hand on how to produce it. Does the reservoir flow easy? Is it light hydrocarbons that flow by their own pressure? Or is it asphaltine rich, thick hydrocarbons, heavy oil like in Venezuela, where you would need expensive steam injections uh, to recover that? So this you will know through the appraisal stage which is a number of wells usually and which takes a couple of years, I would say, never less than two years. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Now we know that uh, Recon and Mibir confirmed an active petroleum system. We keep, we hear Total Energy Shell announcement of discoveries and BW Kudu being in the feed stage, um, which is the front end engineering design, at least the final stage of that. Now, we hear all of this, but what exactly does it mean, a discovery? When we say that we have a discovery, when we say that we have confirmed an active petroleum system, when we say that we are in the final stages or um, a feed stages, what does this mean? Um, thanks, Shopinale. Um, I think some of the stuff um, that Aske has already touched on them, um, especially on the concept of what a petroleum system is, uh, because essentially those are those key ingredients uh, when you, I can give an, you know, an analog, it's like cooking poiki. You know, you need those key, in, you know, ingredients to make it work. So he, he did mention the, uh, uh, the kitchen, that's your source rock. So basically these are, uh, these are uh, materials that have been buried for a long time. And then they have to go some sort of chemical reaction uh, uh, due to temperature uh, and pressure. And so, you know, then those conditions need to be there uh, for it to happen. And then obviously you need the reservoir. Um, so, you know, once we have generated uh, this kerogen, this oil, where is it going to go to? So you need some sort of porous rock uh, where this can be accumulated. So your porous rock, when you can think of it, is like a sponge. Um, you know, a sponge has got porous spaces. If you, if you mess it in water, it's going to absorb a lot of water. Okay? And then it's going to keep it up until such a time that you squeeze it. Okay? And then obviously you need the trap. Um, the trap is just basically to ensure that, uh, you know, these, these accumulations of fluids, they don't escape because if there's nothing that traps them, uh, they, they'll just definitely just go somewhere else. They'll just, you know, escape. And then the other critical element is what you call timing uh, because everything needs to be time relevant. And it needs, the sequence of how it happens, the, the timing is very critical uh, because if the timing you get it wrong, um, then you miss the accumulation. So that's what we call a petroleum system. You need to have all those elements together. Now, in Namibia, for instance, we have all these years with the dry wells. The dry wells for us, like I said, it's information. And that information is the one that lead, led us to believe that even though the Kuru gas field was a gas field when it was discovered in, you know, in 1974 by Chevron, um, you, you know, the thinking, the school of thinking was always known. Namibia is a gas prone region. Okay, so, and under normal, normal circumstances, an exploration company doesn't go out and then drill to find gas. That is not the main, you know, the main goal. The main goal is to find the black gold. Okay, so, yeah, so, 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 so we have that. So that proved to us that if you have gas, okay, the petroleum system is working. The question is that how do we find the rest of the, you know, you know, you know, the, you know, the puzzles? Then we keep drilling all these wells, and then we, you know, we end up finding the reservoirs. You know, the reservoirs are there. Um, uh, the trap, or you know, we have good traps. You know, you know, uh, geometries in terms of the in terms of the shells. Uh, but the timing, it seems like it, everything was right because our neighbors uh, in Angola they have, in South Africa they are producing gas. Uh, so why not in Namibia? In Brazil, we even you know we even try to compare the conjugate margins between Namibia and Brazil. 
uh, to see we, we know whether what they're seeing in Brazil because they also discover uh, some giant fields there, whether it works in Namibia as well. And then only in 2013 when HRT came in, they completely changed the picture again because when they found that oil, which Dr. Anske uh, mentioned, non-technical, it was a non-technical discovery, basically just th that means that you, know, you can't make money out of it. Um, uh, 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 because the way, you know, the way it was accumulated, uh, the geological would not allow you to squeeze that rock and then get that oil out, okay? So all the puzzles, you know, you have solved the puzzles, everything is in place. And then it took us again a bit of time uh, where we are at the moment, and that's when our total and then Shell um, have made these discoveries. But with these discoveries themselves also came challenges, uh, because when you look at the depth of where these discoveries are, you know, the discoveries are made, especially like for Nubil, like the one for Total, it, it, it's, it's not really your common um, 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 a geological environment where we would find this discovery because it's deep. Uh, so it, basically, you know, the conditions are, are, may prove to be challenging um, and, and nonetheless it happened. So, yeah, so basically that what happened. So when we drill these wells, we prove that you know, uh, hydrocarbon accumulation, and it does exist because, you know, the reservoirs prove them. But the question is that, uh, can we manage to recover it um, at, at, the depth at, what, at the depth where these discoveries are made? So, so again, those are technical questions that we need to, you know, to, you know, to still, uh, you know, ask ourselves so that we can, you know, uh, solve the puzzle. Dr. Anska also mentioned that not a single well can give you that definite information on how you're going to produce the field. And that's why now you keep, you know, you need to do the appraisal, um, a, a program that you need to go through because one well, you know, ge geologically, things can change very quickly. Uh, you found something here, but then maybe uh, 10 kilometers, there's nothing. So you start asking yourself those questions. What is happening in between if there's nothing on the other side, but it seems to be within the same play concept. So that's what we are trying to do at the moment with Total and Shell, because we need to resolve the issue of reservoir quality. This is you know, your porosity and permeability. Porosity is just basically means, can the sponge hold water? Permeability means that if I squeeze the sponge, can I get the water out? And you must also remember that there is the issue of recovering factor, that you can't really squeeze everything out. At, at most ultra deep waters where we are, maybe we are looking at maybe what? At, if you are lucky now, if the reservoir, you know, the reservoir behind behave or the sand behaves, then you can get maybe 55%, 60% uh, recovering factor. So the complexity is actually in the geology itself, okay? Henceforth, it's worth noting that uh, what Dr. Anske mentioned also, to, you know, to say that not every discovery can lead to a commercial um, um, a field. Because if the technical and the economics, they do not allow it, that field can be what we regarded as stranded field because we will not be able to produce and make money out of it. So, you know, so that's what normally happens. So, so for us is to conform at the moment with the appraisal wells is to conform the commerciality of what we have discovered so that at the end of the day, you'll be able to produce the field. Thank you, Martin. And I want to just build on uh, the, the response that you gave there. You, you spoke about you cannot, you cannot take everything out, maybe just a certain percentage. Maybe you can tell us why this is. Um, we hear you say the words recoverable, uh, uh, recoverable, but can you tell us what recover, what the why recoverable? What does that mean? That's number one. And also, is it only the quantities that you can get out that uh, that determine the commerciality, or is the quality of the product does it also play a role in the commerciality of the product? Yeah, fair. thanks for that follow up question. When we mean recovery, basically it means that um, the reservoir itself is very complex. Okay, uh, due to either chemical reactions with the reservoir, uh, it could be that uh, maybe it's cemented. So you know the the flow of the fluids uh, when you're producing may not be able to you know to move the you know the oil out. You also have a pressure issue again um, because under natural conditions you want the you know the oil to flow naturally without really having a secondary uh, in, in, in you know enhancement. And the other thing, obviously, you need to maintain uh, the, reservoir, you know, the reservoir pressure of, of basically the field because if you don't, you, you, know, you end up losing it and you end up producing, you know, producing water, for instance. So those are the things that you try to avoid 
Um, on, yeah, basically, on your second question, just repeat it again. Is it only the quantities that you're getting out that, uh, that determine the quality or, or that determine the commerciality? Is it also the quality of product that's under the ground? The quality of the product is it's, it's a very important thing because when you look at our discoveries, for instance, they are light oil. So with light oil, they are very volatile. Uh, let me put it that way. So it's something in between almost gas and, and, and the liquid. Um, the liquid itself is not that heavy black oil. So, so that is the quality of it. So within that itself, it makes it very complex to produce it because what form of production mechanism are you going to use to ensure that you produce it correctly without even, at the end of the day, producing water? Okay. So the quality also, it plays a very important part. And that is the reason why the, you know, the JV, especially uh, Total and Shell, they actually are, you know, going after this, you know, this, uh, uh, this quality oil. Because it, it also fetches a premium price. Because it's not really that heavily contaminated with other things. So are we saying that our light oil um, is amongst the best? Is it the top part of, of, the, of um, the top quality or is it the bottom part? I don't want to preempt anything. I don't want to preempt anything at this point in time, but I think a lot of those answers we will know once all the analysis are done. Uh, so we can really, really understand uh, 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 the nature of the fluids. But at this point in time, um, I think I think we you know we, we could say we are really comfortable with what we found. It's 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 really premium stuff. A very safe answer. We are comfortable. Um, now we know that. It's, it's not, and I think when we, when this, when we all started talking about oil and gas in Namibia, when the discoveries were announced, when the interest came in, uh, did we all have an idea that, okay, today people talk about discoveries, come 2025, I can go put uh, fuel in my car um, that comes from the discoveries that were announced. How long, and it can come from any of uh, the two of you, how long plus minus is the entire journey and where are we, Namibia, in that journey? I think I'll take the first part, and then Dr. Anske can come in. Um, I think in the journey, where we are right now, I think we are, we, are, we are definitely like babies. Okay, But being babies, it means that it allows us to learn from what others have done before. Um, but because the journey is going to be long, but it's going to be exciting as well. Um, so at this point in time for us, we're learning how to walk, okay? Uh, because having found what we have found, as we call them elephants, we want to eat it pieces by pieces, but we want to eat it in the right way. Because, you know, you don't want, um, at the end of the day, uh, but, you, know, you, you know, you have these, um, uh, uh, these discoveries, but you're not able to commercialize them. I think very important comments there that we want to eat, we want to eat the elephant, but we want to eat it in the right way. Dr. Anska, if you can help with uh, or to stay with the timeline. Yeah, the timeline. With the introduction, uh, we are now at the beginning of the appraisal phase. It may take uh, another few years. Maybe the big company has uh, Total and Shell. They can speed it up if they if they have the capacity. But still, I would expect more than two years uh, for the appraisal to complete. Once the appraisal is done, it goes, um, as you asked me earlier, into the feed stage, where actually the kudu is currently. Feed means you understand to some degree your reservoirs, you understand your market, uh, your customers. So what is the optimum design, technical engineering design of your field development? Field management in the technical design of uh, the production wells, um, the production facilities, are these uh, floating platforms, are these pipelines, uh, the subsea infrastructure, uh, the offloading points to the customer. So all this uh, needs to be engineered and designed. And once you have the final design, we term it as a front end engineering design, which allows you under various scenarios that this will likely work. This allows you to get a quite precise cost estimate 
And based on this, then the really tough decision comes, uh, which is the investment decision, to see go ahead, yes or no, after uh, the feed stage. So the feed itself and then the investment decision phase are the most crucial ones, whether we have a stranded field or these probably giant fields offshore Namibia will change the country from an economic and socio-economic perspective in the next couple of decades. Thank you, Doctor. Um, Martin, you spoke about uh, Namco being carried in all the licenses. You spoke about Namco participating. Um, but can you tell us what is government's participation in the sector? Not only just the percentage, uh, the carried on percentage, but do we have people who actually uh, work, um, who are able to learn from the operators? Do we have access to the data? How does government participate to the activity, um, in the activities currently happening in the country? All right, thanks again for that question. Um, I'm trying to avoid not to speak for government, <laughs> since I'm representing an organization which is... Uh, yes, please, we only want your mind, so we only need a technical response. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically with government is that from the onset already, um, I think government has been very much involved in the activities um, and, and been, you know, I can, I can name few, you know, few, you know, few stakeholders that have really been part of this journey. I mean, Mines and Energy, for instance, have been the, you know, the pioneer of you know of the industrial the, because this is where everything else happened. I mean, with over them, they need to make sure that you know they overlook what the activities of these companies are doing to make sure that they conform to what they have actually signed up for in terms of what they have in the petroleum agreement. And from what you have seen already is that I think our you know our legislations, for instance, especially the, you know from the environment point you know point of view, I think it's it's one of the best. You can already see, if I can give an example in South Africa, what happened in South Africa, where the industrial just came to oil and gas, suddenly almost came to a standstill uh, because of environmental issues. But I think with government, uh, especially MME, uh, they've been really at the forefront um, uh, uh, during this stage to ensure that those activities are conducted, like I said, and conforms uh, to best international standards. Um, when you look at the Minister of Environment, you know, Forestry and Tourism, I mean, again, they've, they've been involved in the activities to make sure that the permittings are in place. Because you can't just, you know, you just, a company can't just, uh, you know, pick up, come to Namibia and then start shooting, you know, you know data wherever they want to shoot. They need to, shoot, they need to ensure that they have the right permits in place. And they also need to make sure that they have the right uh, plans in place in case things, you know, things go wrong. Um, Again, coming back to MME, um, uh, even Nampol, for instance, the police onshore. Um, I mean, if you're going to use dynamites, they need to make sure that those explosives they don't, you know, they don't shoot people's houses off, you know. So, Minister of Health again. I mean, uh, sometimes we tend to use uh, radioactive materials. We need to make sure that we also speak to them as stakeholders. And then uh, fisheries again, especially offshore. Uh, we engage them, especially when you are shooting seismic, because they, they, there was always a narrative to say that uh, seismic activities have an effect on the fishery industry. So we did, you know, they, especially our members, we did do studies to prove that that's not really the case. But even so, even during the drilling activities, uh, companies are taking up, you know, that effort to ensure that environmental baseline studies are done. Um, with MME, again, the involvement in these whole activities, especially where we are um, in the appraisal phase, they need, to, they need to ensure that those plans are submitted by the companies before they operate. Okay, so they, are give, they need to be given the approvals. So they can't just decide, no, we're going to be shooting or we're going to be you know, drilling more holes. Because you drilling more holes also has an impact. A, a and I must say that working in the sector myself, it's a very stringent, very strict sector, and rightfully so. Um, we keep being told that we should not expect uh, or the benefit. Many people talk about when the product is found, when the product is found. But is the country benefiting from the activities now at the stage that we are at, whether through data, whether through employment? Are we benefiting? at the moment, is there any money that's coming in from these activities? Yeah, that's, a, you know, Shapanale, that's a very good question. And 
think that is the question that we always get. Uh, that No, these things are happening and we are not seeing anything. I think it takes one a bit of time to, to you know, I can, I can really, you know, roughly say this. Go to Ludwitz in Wabish Bay. And, and, and you just come back and tell us, what do you see? Um, even, even recently, you know, there was an announce, you know, in a publication being made that the level of investment in Namibia has increased over, in, over the last couple of years or so. Some of that, you know, increase in, you know, investment could, could possibly be from these activities. So for us, in terms of oil and gas, what we are seeing at the moment is that um, the right companies, especially Namibian companies, that are in the right space in terms of offering services and goods, are actually the one in a better position to actually monetize the values from these activities because they are offering a service and goods. Uh, because within the petroleum agreement, uh, there is a provision that is made by government to ensure that a certain portion of services and goods must be sourced locally. It's, it, it's, it's in the petroleum agreement. Okay, so from what we have seen is that from the operation side of our, you know, for our members, if you look at the flight services from, from Ventuk to Ludwitz, for instance, they've been contracted to a Namibian company, which is Wesley. Again, it's a Namibian company registered in Namibia. Logistic services in Valves Bay and Ludwitz, again, these are given to Namibian companies. In partnership, obviously, with maybe international companies that have more experience in that. Accommodation services, in both in Ventuk, Ludwitz, and Valvis Basin, oh, yeah, Valvis Bay, for instance, in Swakop and Ludwitz, and Rundu, yes, Recon, those are hosted by Namibian companies. Okay, these are basically your hotels and guest houses and so forth. Legal services, again, we have Namibian companies, we have Shakwa, Nyambe is got use on fraternity, and then plus others. These are services that are also given to by Namibian company to some of these IOCs. Again, there's money being spent by these companies for such services. Shuttle services, I could go on and on and on. It's just that you don't really expect these companies, where we are right now in the industrial, to really fully hire um, our Namibians because the project themselves are not really at that mature stage where, you, where a company can be comfortable enough to say that we're gonna hire Namib you know, 100 Namibians to go on operations. Um, so yeah, so that is the reality of of, of where the industrial is at the moment. Up until such a time, we pass that gate. That appraisal phase is very critical. Because after that, Dr. Anske touched it, it's a development stage. Because that one is a whole different ballgame. And that's where I want to be. Because where the first three stages is not really much value is created, but we, we are seeing a, a bits of pieces here and there. Martin, thank you so much for mentioning that uh, you spoke about uh, placing yourself in the right space in the sector because the value chain is very long and um, this is also one of the topics that we will be discussing in one of the con uh, one of the public lectures i think it's lecture number three two or three after this one so i urge you to please come out for that one where you will understand how do you ready yourself to participate so thank you very much for also highlighting that um we will take a f we will have more questions before we open the floor uh for uh, questions on the floor uh, uh, based on the content that we uh, that we shared uh, today, uh, but I want to I want to ask you again, and I know that this is a question that many people um, are probably asking. And this is now we've already spoken about the appraisal stage. You've spoken about exploration stage. You've spoken about reconnaissance stage, and we all want to be in the development and production stage. How far are we from that? Yeah, like I said, everything else is time. It, it comes to time. Time is, it's, it's, even though it waits, no for, you know, it waits for no man, um, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, we are not that far uh, when you look from where we are coming from. I mean, <laughs> who would guess 1974? All discoveries 2013, uh, 2023. That is almost 50 years. So, so time where we are in terms of the operations is that, like Dr. Anske mentioned it, appraisal is normally about two years. Um, and then after that, you need to declare to government in terms of the commerciality, what are you going to do next in terms of the government timelines now? And then that itself, there is months there that government, oh, yeah, government obviously have to study 
and then analyze what you know what is given to them and then obviously then after that the companies um, they can declare the field and then they need to apply for a production license but the sequences of events um, they sort of happen concurrently with what the operator is also doing because remember that once you pass the stage that dot you know daughter uh, the, the the decision gate uh, once you pass the FID once your feed is done then you pass your FID because that is the FID is basically is your it's a company's permitting to invest yes to invest so the timing from appraisal up until production on on and on average maybe 5 years from now Four, four, five years from now, depending on the if nothing changes, because remember the industries are very sensitive. If you change your laws very quickly, investors they become a bit shaky also. So, so they you know there are a lot of dynamics that uh, uh, that goes uh, into it. Yeah. Thank you. Before we open the floor for questions, uh, Dr. Anska, you've given us such a beautiful picture about the activities during exploration stage during appraisal stage, drilling into the ground, the stratigraphic wants to understand the geology that gives us the information. I don't want us to go too deep into production stage, the activities of production stage, because we're not there yet and we want to manage expectations. But just from a technical geological um, position, can you just give us a brief of what type of activities take place um, during production? Essentially, production is, is an ongoing operation it's a, once you have developed your field, that means you have um, a placed your equipment, your installations, which is a major engineering and construction effort. Once this is done, it is from the outside more or less static. You have your platform there, it produces oils, either the oil flows in the pipeline to the stock tanks, and the tankers come and take it wherever they take it, or they go to the floating uh, platform and take it from there. So there is an ongoing dynamic, but still, as you produce, you need to make sure that the production stays or is increased over a certain time period. It usually reaches a plateau stage. So reservoir engineers will be, will be permanently monitoring and where necessarily intervene, let's say with further wells, with side tracks, with new perforations, with injection wells. Uh, to continue production and also then it depends on the amount of, of petroleum produced and on the market conditions whether you have then the secondary industry that means the midstream the refineries being built and when this is happening you have other secondary industries to support all this engineering all those transported so essentially if this discovery and production is at a scale where the economy of scales justifies to have in country the follow-up industry, it, it will eff essentially affect the entire economy and, and all sectors. Thank you, Doctor. I think the message is very clear. And I don't want to take away from the conversation that's going to happen when we have our local content topic for the public lectures. But I think the, the message is very clear. We need to prepare, we need to ready ourselves to, uh, to accommodate the value chain that comes with a production. So thank you very much, uh, Martin, Dr. Vanka, thank you very much. I think for that really, um, I know that I've been hammering to please not be so technical. I think there are still some areas where you can maybe just not shy away. But I think uh, you really, really uh, rendered uh, uh, very well in terms of speaking the layman's language to such a technical field. We will now open the uh, floor for questions. Um, if we can just please give the panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please do, uh, there's an email that was shared uh, for the RSVP. If you do have any follow-up questions, afterthoughts, when you maybe go to bed tonight and you think about anything uh, Dr. Wanke said or anything that Martin said, please do send them through and we'll make sure that we'll get a response for you. Again, uh, the individuals sitting here on the panel are representing in a technical position. So they're here 
as technical people in the field. Therefore, I really urge you when you ask your questions, let it be based on the content that we shared here. Let it be based on the content of the message, which is educating the Namibian nation on the journey of oil and gas and where we are at. They solely wear the hats of the technical position. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can start uh, by, we'll take um, in the questions, if we can take them in the portions of four, five. So I saw hands go up here the first time. So we'll take, my apologies, I said, I, it's, it's a blur, but if you can, if somebody can help us here, Maria, if you can assist us. If we can have, there's a gentleman waving his hand. He put up his hand first, and then there's a gentleman there at the back. We'll take two from this side. The gentleman in front with the glasses will come back to you, and then we'll take that's two questions. We'll take the one here in the middle, and then for gender, um, for gender balance, I will take the lady, the lady here with the hat, and then I'll take the lady there at the back. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, you had your hand up first. So if I can start from the back there, please. Sorry, this is not a question, but I'm asking something. Uh, you say four questions in total. Four, right? Four, okay. I'm going to ask two, then you ask two. Oh, sorry. Oh, you mean per person? Four per person. Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay. This is also, I just wanted to know, are those slides of Martin available? This is not an official question, but are those slides available? Okay. This is the, now the question. Um, yeah, thank you for, thank you all for being here. Um, I just want to know the following. Um, is the training that that includes scholarships that NAMPOA, NAMCOR, Recon Africa, and the EU provides to upskill to upskill Namibians? Okay, I think uh, that was one of my questions. Um, the other question that I had is it's, uh, it's more on um, uh, the issue that uh, you. No, okay. The issue that you touched on regarding the timing, um, and, and I want to ask this uh, with reference to the recent conversations that have been going on on things like green hydrogen and, and, and transition to, you know, electrical vehicles and all these kind of things. So, and, and with reference to what was said, um, that most of these things could take time. Um, wouldn't sort of it be a risky um, time to actually be going into um, um, oil as, um, you know, with reference to how it was in the past, given now that we have um, technological um, um, upgrades on vehicles and, and all that. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Zakaria Shia. I have a question for Chairperson Martin, and Dr. Wanke is also welcome to answer this question. My question is... Uh, if perhaps there is um, an alternative currency other than the US dollar, that yeah, if there's an alternative currency, um, how will that affect um, how will that affect um, oil activities, oil or gas activities within Namibia? Hmm? 
Oh, okay. Um, my question was, if there was perhaps an alternative currency other than the US dollar, how would it affect oil and gas activities within Namibia? Um, can we just, Maria, there was this lady, I, I skipped her, she, she had her hand up first, and then there was the lady at the back, I acknowledge you, I just needed to acknowledge her because she had her hand up first and I skipped her, I apologize. And can we just ask that when you do um, ask your question, um, can you just uh, stand up please, because we understand that might be the, um, the issue with the mic. Okay, so good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Atusha Mubanenwa. The question I wanted to ask is, uh, this was something raised to the, one of the panelists, Mr. Martin, and it was regarding our involvement in the development and construction phase. What are the skills you would say Namibians need to prepare themselves in order to, when that stage arrives, what would, the, what would you say the skills would be? And for the people who are, let's say, in the working class, how best would it be that they can prepare themselves to be in that industry and that time arises? Thank you. Um, good evening. My name is Natalia. I just wanted to ask that after the oil has been extracted, it needs to be refined. I wanted to ask, do we have, um, do we have industry experts and do we have the machinery necessary in order to be able to refine the oil here in Namibia? And if not, since we are still in the baby stage before we get to the refining stage, what are the plans then for to equip Namibia with the experts and the necessary machinery and equipment for us to be able to refine the oil here in Namibia so it does not have to be refined in another country? Uh, yes, uh, good evening. Uh, I'll pose my question to Martin. Uh, so you are using the word uh, squeeze. So let me say when you squeeze the, uh, this fluid uh, out of these rocks, uh, then you have these uh, empty spaces. So I wanted to know what happened to these empty spaces. Do they just uh, remain as some space uh, that once had oil or they require some sort of uh, rehabilitation? Okay. Um, any anyone can be can go. Okay. I think Martin had. Yeah, uh, I had a handful, so I'll just I'll, I'll just get into it. Um, I think the gentleman at the back um, asked a question related to training uh, to us to upskill Namibians. I think over the years, petrol fund um, has been has has really been the vehicle uh, for actually training Namibians um, in terms of fields related to. Um, to science, let me just put it that way. Um, as you're already aware, this fund is heavily funded by, by the operators. And that is why uh, um, I remember Ms. Nillian when she was here last year. Uh, uh, you know, she, she actually mentioned that how the fund is actually funded uh, because they, the operators have an obligations 
uh, to pay a contribution. So, so what happens that over the years, uh, I know Petrofan has been sponsoring students, um, both geology and yeah, and then so forth, and then you know those that are doing science and then education and maths and, and you know maths and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that is our vehicle. Even now, as we speak, um, there have been a lot of students or, or Namibians that have been been part of the you know, that have been recipients of that fund who have studied South Africa, the UK, especially in oil and gas. Uh, but at the stage where we are, like for instance, right now, um, you know they they you know, they actually put out a I think it's a, a survey, a workforce survey, uh, where they requested Namibians who have a certain skills to, you know, to provide their CVs. I don't know what the plans of petrol fund is, um, but I'm quite sure that it's something related uh, to, you know, to, you know, to train, to, you know, to train those Namibians that have a, maybe a bit of a skill, or those that that needs to be trained to be actually be part of these activities. Okay. Um, Dr. Hanske, you want to take the energy transition? Yeah, maybe if, I, if you allow me, uh, there was a, a similar question. Uh, once we go into the development phase uh, and also about uh, having a refinery here, what skills will be needed and are we fit for that? Uh, the main workforce, uh, local workforce, will be initially needed for the development phase. So that means um, when the installations are made and this in particularly uh, uh, requires uh, artisan skills uh, like welders, uh, transport logistics, uh, plumbers, electricians, engineers. And the same also accounts for establishing a refinery. Yeah, there is no refinery in Namibia. There are refineries in South Africa. There is one also upgraded now in Angola as uh, one of the two main producing oil producing countries of Africa. So ideally, uh, having a refinery is what we all uh, like to achieve in terms of um, a value chain creation. It's a capital investment, so it requires uh, a minimum amount of crude that is processed and sold uh, to a market. So it is really an economy of scale whether this will happen or not, or when it happens. Let's say oil production starts, but it just put on a tanker and send sold international. More uh, fields start producing, and then the threshold is reached. That's how I foresee it, actually, uh, that a uh, refinery will be justified with according a uh, value creation. Now, regarding energy transition, it comes actually back to my study times <laughs> as a geology. Uh, I focus on sedimentary basins, and um, this is related to oil and gas, and my first job was actually in oil and gas uh, back in the days, uh, far over 20, 20 years ago. And I first thought, ah, it's boring. I already thought something new. But over the years, um, I realized how interesting it is, how much the technology has developed, and as we have now an accelerated energy transition, uh, looking into the prediction of the future of the industry is particularly difficult. Um, I looked at, at recent energy outlooks and projections, and I must say I found them a little bit confusing and couldn't really find an answer. A few years back, I think it was a, a BP energy outlook from, from 2020, uh, which I looked into some more details, and this prediction at this time was that um, with the decreased exploration we had, which is now just up picking now, we will have an energy supply gap of, uh, of hydrocarbons uh, with, a, with a growing uh, population and energy demand of about 8%, which needs to be filled with more, not just exploration, with more discoveries. And this scenario was modeled by, um, by a scenario in which we still consume the same or slightly increasing amount of coal as today, and by increasing the renewables by over 300%. So even if the energy transition goes faster, as long as we don't 
um, significantly reduce the amount of coal, we need to get the energy from somewhere else. And uh, gas and oil, and particularly gas, will very likely for a number of decades uh, be this uh, transition energy to fill the gap. And as we saw at the introduction, the demand is still rising. So the peak hasn't been achieved yet. So that's what I can say. Yeah, just to add on to what Dr. Anske just said, um, I think the most important thing is that when, you know, whenever if people have time, uh, if you just look, if you just search all these companies, especially the international IOCs, and then you read their investor presentations, you will realize that, you know, oil and gas, especially oil, is a very much big part of, you know, of, uh, you know, of, let me put it, the portfolio. Um, it's, they can't, you know, you know, they don't want to share away from it, but at the same time, they also want to reduce uh, their carbon footprint. That's why they are coming up with a lot of mechanisms um, in terms of, the gentleman did mention uh, a green hydrogen, uh, but oil and gas companies are coming up with innovative way uh, to try and reduce their carbon you know, footprint. That's one. Um, on the third question, the gentleman asked on the currency, the alternative currency. Unfortunately, at the moment where we are, all is traded in the US dollar currency. And until such a time that uh, something changes, I know that there are happenings uh, in, in, in the global market at the moment after, you know, after Russia invaded Ukraine and yeah, it's, 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 it's another discussion for another day. Um, but at the moment in time, I'd, I'm not really, I don't see uh, companies really moving away from the dollar, um, especially where we are and, and, and until such a time something changes. Um, the last question from, that was asked, it was in terms of the reservoir. How do you, you know, how do you, you, know, how do you keep it uh, intact if you're going to squeeze everything out? Remember that the reservoir is a composition of different um, uh, fluids. Uh, you know, you have your, your oil, and then your gas, and then, and then a bit of water, if, if, if there is water in it. So what normally happens with most companies is that in, or, during exp exploration to, you know, to maintain that reservoir pressure, when you are draining out the oil, you tend to, to, uh, to, you know, to, to inject what we call injection. Either you're injecting with gas or water. Now, in our case, we know for a fact that the fluids that we have, they are very light. So would you want to use water? Probably not. Gas? Maybe. Uh, but, you, but you still have to understand you know, what will be the impact of it. So to maintain it, uh, to maintain that pressure so that you know, it, 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 it doesn't really squeeze at the point where you lose it, uh, that's where you need to inject either water or gas. Thank you very much. And I know that um, we are pressed for time. And we are being told that we have gone way over the time allocated to us. And I'm going, my head is probably going to roll for this. But I will allow for at least, if, if to indulge, I will allow for two more questions. Okay, I'll take the young lady here right in front of me. Then I'll go. Okay, can I, can I take two, two ladies, please? I'll take this very excited, um, my, 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 la my lady here, um, because I know that you also tried to raise your hand in the first round. So we'll take those two questions just for the interest of time. I, I sincerely apologize. I, I know you also want to, you were pressing from the first round, but I again urge you that if you have any questions that are pressing, please do send it to the email. There is an email on the post, not on the program, on the, on the poster. If you go onto the Namibia University of Science and Technology page, you will find that there's one that says inquiries. It's um, foundation at NAST. Please, we urge you, this is not the last uh, session that we're going to have. So we urge you to please share that. We have the, our, we'll be able to forward those questions to our panelists and then we'll be able to have a response to you. So young, the young lady and ma'am, but I think we can start here, if you're okay with that. Okay. She, um, she can go, she offered. Oh, you can start there. Uh, 
very good evening. My name is Maya. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think my question is more on a consultative level with local communities. What are we doing or are there platforms to prevent what happened with Econ Africa? Is there anything that we can do? Because I feel like people are trying to move away from fossil fuels and more renewable um, energy resources. There is the economic spin off. We get the economic spin off. We, got, we get the game changer of oil and gas exploration in Namibia. But is there consultation with our local communities? What are we doing to avoid what's happening right now with Recon Africa and the Okavango Delta Basin? Thank you. <laughs> okay, then we'll take the question from the young lady. We have, we have, we're taking, we are pressed for time, ma'am. We've identified the two. And then if there are any pressing questions, there is an email where you can send your questions to. Thank you. If you can just stand for sound purposes, please. Um, good evening. My name is Helene Pauls. Um, my question is, in the current status quo, we do not have oil and gas causes being offered in the country. And like you have answered, there are, bursaries and scholarships to those that want to study. Um, my question is mainly for higher institutions. Will higher institutions prioritize courses that specialize in this field to give opportunities to those students that cannot afford to go abroad and those that do not get scholarships because it's so difficult for you to get funding from example NSFAF to go study abroad. And according to research, oil and gas Engine, I mean, oil and gas courses are not offered in Africa. They are mostly offered way abroad. So can higher institutions then come up with courses or will they prioritize coming up with courses that specialize in this field? Thank you very much. I think that's uh, Dr. Ansgar. If you can take that one. Yeah, first, first question, yeah. To the first questions uh, uh, regarding onshore exploration activities and community engagement. Um, so I'm a, the geologist working for Reconnaissance Energy in Namibia, which is exploring in the northeast of the country, looking at the subsurface, what is below the ground, and in parallel, um, there were hundreds of, of consultations um, uh, with the communities as onshore exploration also involves activities that happen on the ground. It means you, you transport your rig equipment, um, you, you drive your, um, your vehicles for seismic expedition uh, through the community uh, roads. Uh, so there had been hundreds, I think, of stakeholder meetings. And myself, I joined a few one um, to explain what is actually happening on the surface um, from a technical viewpoint and, and made some demonstration what it is for and uh, which risks are involved. So this has been happening. Um, if I read the media, um, how it has been criticized, uh, my personal opinion and view uh, being in that industry for a while is, is um, it, it's definitely pushed and uh, biased. So there is clearly all this process has been happening and are ongoing. Uh, education. Education is more I'm more familiar with. The reason is uh, I had been uh, teaching geology in, at UNAM for 13 years. Uh, so um, being an explorationist and being a teacher is at my heart. And uh, it was already in 2012 after HRT announced uh, the non-commercial discovery of oil but a proven a petroleum system offshore Namibia in the Valvis Basin. And Namibia uh, received much attention from companies and potential investors 
uh, to further exploration and there was hope that it will and now has become an exploration hotspot. So um, this year I started to design a, a program uh, for petroleum exploration from the geoscience perspective, which was implemented in 2015 to have it local. Also understanding um, that this industry is, um, has very strict quality rules. So if something doesn't meet the international standard as an applicant, as, an, uh, as a certificate, as a training, um, you will not be recognized as an employee. So it was set up with, with international well-recognized institution and um, has been ongoing since then. But as we are in the exploration stage, now entering the, or having entered the appraisal stage, the demand for a local geoscientist was very low, as most of the work was done by consultants or within the bigger company in-house, somewhere overseas. And uh, all those graduates on, on the postgraduate program uh, are accommodated, um, many of them at NAMCOR. Um, yeah, this is regarding uh, local training and otherwise the Petro Fund trains at reputed international institutions send their, uh, the successful applicants there and, and the returners have been accommodated, mostly at the regulators and at NAMCORS, but some already at uh, the operating companies. Shapanelli, maybe yes. if you can just add. Um, Thank you, Dr. Wanka. Her question is quite relevant because um, it's at stage where we are, obviously, the market was flooded of geologists. But things have definitely changed. But it doesn't mean that um, because you studied accounting, for instance, it doesn't mean that you're not fit in the value chain of it. You will. Because it's easy to transform someone uh, knowing that you have already have that qualifications. Uh, you just probably have to understand how the industrial works. With regard to the institutions, I'm not sure really what NAST plans to do in terms of introducing a curriculum uh, focusing on oil, you know, on oil and gas, or uh, neither UNAM, uh, because uh, they NAST have engaged us. Uh, so maybe they are planning to do something. Uh, UNAM, they haven't really, uh, really engaged us. But obviously, TVETs are going to be the main focus, especially as we, as we keep saying from that development stage, because uh, those are hands-on skills. But obviously, you require engineers, like facility engineers and so forth. But it doesn't mean that whatever qualification that you have currently, you cannot be transformed uh, to be able to work in that, you know, in that industry. It's almost like mining. Uh, some, you, know, you don't study to become a mining engineer, but you be, end up being a general manager of a mining company, for instance. So it's just about the skill that you currently have and how do you enhance that skill uh, so you can fit in that value chain. Absolutely. And with that, thank you very much, panelists, before I retire you. I think um, we can also just add on to, uh, to that by saying that the Ministry of Mines and Energy will be hosting a workshop on local content. They've announced it uh, for early May. So I urge you to, I think the, the announcement is out on their social media also. So that is one of the um, workshops that you can also attend to, to answer some of those questions, but very, very relevant questions. I myself am not a geologist, uh, but I work as, uh, as a, a, an executive in an oil sector, which builds on what Martin said. The oil sector is not just confined to geologists, engineer, but it has a long value chain. But very relevant question, I think, that, um, that our leaders can look at. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'll say thank you to our panelists. Uh, if we can just give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. We will then ask, we will then ask uh, Mr. Kanji, the head of the NAS Foundation, alumni from to please give us the goodbye. If we can please give him some respect just so that he can say goodbye, and then we'll call it a night. Thank you. Yeah, mine is just to thank you for the talking. Mine is just to thank you for your attendance. Uh, without you, this event is not going to be a success at all. And we do this event for you also, so that you can have informed, 
decisions so that you can also know what is happening, you enlightened, you participate in the sector, uh, so that at the end of the day, all this exploration, all this oil is benefiting us. So that's the reason we, do, we are doing this. And therefore, you are the most important stakeholders here. Secondly, I would like to thank also the speakers, the panelists. Um, your presentations was really good. I think it was very enlightening. Uh, we also brought a lot of politicians here. So the answer was technical. We have people who also came and talked politics here. Uh, but the sessions are five pay per, per year. So there will also be a mix of everybody. So thank you very much for coming. And again, for our partners, we have made this possible. Our stakeholders, our sponsors. Napoa is one of the biggest uh, sponsors for this year. Recon Africa, Namcor, and of course, the university itself for hosting you here. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you again uh, in the next uh, session. So with that, it's good night. We'll see you for... Oh, there is uh, some refreshments outside for uh, the attendees. We'll see you for the next session where we'll be speaking about oil and gas and the environment. Thank you very much. Have a good evening all. Thank you.